Hare Krishna. So on the occasion of Shila Prabhupada's appearance day, we will discuss about Prabhupada's extraordinary contribution. And I'll discuss it, Prabhupada's historic outreach. We'll discuss it in three broad perspectives. And uh, what he achieved, how he achieved, and what we can learn from it. I will use it, I, I'll talk about it in three points. This is three T's. The timing, the teaching, and the tuning. Tuning means how he was able to understand his audience and tune the message to that audience. So there is an uh, American thinker, Mark Twain, who said that when I was uh, 17, my father was a fool. Now I am 25 and I'm amazed how much the old guy has learned in the last eight years. <laughs> so what he of course meant was that it's, yeah, maybe the father had learned something in the last eight years. But more importantly, it is that the son grows. And as the son grows, he also learns. He learns based on his experience. So a person at the age of 25 sees things with substantial difference from how they will see it at the age of 20 or 17. So, so similarly over here, when we try to appreciate Srila Prabhupada, the, as we try to do some service, then we start appreciating what has been done before. One of the things in life is that everything seems easy or at least easier when we are spectators. It's like, say, now the cricket fever is coming up. India is going to have a uh, the host the World Cup. So everybody makes decisions. You know, you know, this batsman should have been sent before, or this player should have been selected. This should have been done. That should have been done. So many people have so many ideas of what should be done and how it should be done. But... When somebody actually starts taking the responsibility of being a captain and deciding in the heat of the moment, they realize it's so much more difficult. So it was Srila Prabhupada's biography, the Lila Amrit, that inspired me most uh, powerfully among many other inspirations to dedicate my life to try to share Krishna's message. And uh, even now, that is one of the most inspiring books for me. But now when I look back, I understand that there is uh, so much that Prabhupada has done, which I am learning to appreciate now, especially for the last 10 years. I have been given the service of trying to connect with especially Western audiences in America. So almost nine months a year, uh, I am outside India. And uh, along with Indians outside India, there are, I also try to reach out to Westerners and I try to understand uh, not just Western culture, but Western intellectual history and the Western way of thinking. And that has increased both you know, in appreciation, or in many ways, our spiritual advancement, it's, you know, because Krishna conscious growth, spiritual advancement is actually a growth in appreciation. Now, we are chanting the same holy names and pure devotees are chanting the same holy names. But they appreciate that this holy name is not just a sound, this is Krishna. We don't appreciate it so much. So my appreciation has increased in twofold. So what Prabhupada has done and also what Krishna did for Srila Prabhupada. Means how in general, when anything is done, there are two factors for success. 
as we know in the Damodar Lila, it's our endeavor and Krishna's grace. So, both how our endeavor, how, what was Srila Prabhupada's endeavor, and how Krishna was playing, how Krishna was uh, arranging things for Prabhupada. We can appreciate both uh, through this analysis. So, Prabhupada said in his famous song, Markine Bhagavad Dharma, he said, Make me dance. Nachao, Nachao Prabhu, Nachao Se Mate. Kashthera Putli Jata, Nachao Se Mate. So, we will look at it in terms of two things. You know, how Srila Prabhupada danced expertly and brilliantly, and how Krishna created a stage for Prabhupada through dance. Krishna arranged the stage for Prabhupada. And in this way, we see both the, not just, we don't see a pure devotee in isolation, we see a pure devotee in connection. And that reciprocation between what we are doing and how Krishna is, uh, what Krishna is doing, that, that combination of this, both of these together, is the dynamism of devotion. And that's what we also want to experience in our life. Our endeavor, Krishna's reciprocation. So let's begin with the first point of timing. If you look at Srila Prabhupada's life, it's it's both uh, inspiring and sobering. Vishla Prabhupada was born in 19, 1896. He met his Guru Maharaj in 1922. And till 1965, Prabhupada endeavored enormously in India. Prabhupada, the sheer number of things he tried is mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada initially thought that, let me uh, run a business so that through that business, I will support my spiritual master's mission. I'm a grahastha now. I cannot renounce my family. They are, uh, he had a young child and he had a young wife. So he said, I, can, I cannot, it will be unfair to them. And Prabhupada worked extremely hard for his business. If you see in in generally, India at that time was quite, uh, people generally thought economic stability. Mm -hmm. So, for example, most people would look for a job. And if you get a job, then you are settled for life. That was the idea. If somebody gets a business also, just settle in the business. But Prabhupada traveled across India. He started a business in Kolkata. Then he did a business in Mumbai. Then he did a business in Prayag. Now, these three are almost three different corners of India. And in those times, one of my friends uh, studied Shri Prabhupada's life in greater historical context. And I also studied that time of Indian history, 1920s, 30s. Very few people would actually uh, relocate from one part to another, another part of the country. And so many different parts and start a business from scratch. That itself was extraordinary, what Shri Prabhupada tried in terms of business. And that was, again, for the purpose of offering financial support. Then Shri Prabhupada tried his own writings. He started the Back to Godhead magazine. He worked extremely hard. But somehow, people were just not interested. At that time, like now also, uh, most Indians uh, were Hindi-speaking. And Prabhupada wanted to write in English. So for an English paper, there was not much audience. And Prabhupada was struggling to try to distribute it. One time he was uh, knocked down by a cow while he was distributing back to God in the burning heat of Delhi. He was also at one time, uh, he just swooned. He fell unconscious because of the heat over there. So that, that didn't work out very well. Then Srila Prabhupada tried establishing the League of Devotees. That was an organization he started in Jhansi. And he put 
he almost shut down his business at that time, focused entirely on that. And people seemed to be interested. But then suddenly, those very people who were supporting him, they felt that, oh, let's use this place for some other cause. And Prabhupada was left all alone. And he just had to leave from there. So that didn't work out. Then he tried to you know, edit a God Brothers magazine. Um, there's a Gaudiya Mutt. Gaudiya Mutt had many. But then those people, I'm not going in sequence over here. I'm just talking in terms of what all he tried. And that, that God Brother was very parochial, narrow in his vision. And he didn't give Prabhupada much editorial freedom. He did not give Prabhupada the opportunity to expand the magazine to make it more relevant. And that didn't work out. And then Prabhupada tried to give live classes. He tried to do it in Delhi. He tried to do it especially in, the, in uh, various places. But at that time, people just took it as, yeah, pious, nice thing to do. But it didn't, it didn't seem to work out at all. And then even when he went to America, while he was going to America, the first thing that happened was his only resource, materially speaking, was his body. And he got a heart attack. Not just a heart attack, but two heart attacks. And that was devastating. When he came to America also, at that time, after great struggle, he found that there are some people who were interested and one of them seemed to be uh, about to become a disciple, is David. So it is like a prospective disciple. And what happened is he attacked Prabhupada in a drug-induced mania. And Prabhupada had just to leave that place. So here if you see, it's not just struggle after struggle. See, struggle is bad enough if we consider when we get discouraged. Mm -hmm. So struggle itself is bad enough, but failure is even worse. If after struggle we get some success, that's, that's at least worth it. But there's failure. And Srila Prabhupada still continued on. When Prabhupada decided to go to America, he... It was an extraordinarily courageous act. He was going all alone at the age of 70 without any institutional support, without any significant financial backing, without even knowing who the person who was going to host him. Prabhupada went all the way. And so when I'm using this word timing, I'm using it to two sense, senses. Timing was... Prabhupada required enormous patience. You know, patience, perseverance. Sometimes the word patience has more of a passive connotation. Okay, just, just wait. But perseverance means we keep trying. So Prabhupada had such perseverance, which is unbelievable. If Prabhupada had that faith. If things are going to work, they will work in Krishna's time. So when we talk about timing, we need to be ready to wait for Krishna's time. Things work in this world according to Krishna's plan. And we need to keep serving, keep trying, doing our part, irrespective of whether we get success or not. What Krishna talks about in the Bhagavad Gita, Karman Neva Adhikaraste Maafaleshu Kadachana, 247. Prabhupada demonstrates that over here. So, but I also demonstrate. So, I said I'll talk everything in terms of two things: the Prabhupada's endeavor and Krishna's arrangement. Now, we'll talk about timing in terms of hmm, the U.S. socio-cultural setting. Now, Prabhupada did not, uh, in any way, study American history to know this is the time I should go over there. But as I said, Krishna was arranging a stage for Srila Prabhupada. So, three things happened at that time by which Prabhupada, Krishna created that stage for Prabhupada. One was political. The second was religious. 
and the third was probably the most important that was the cultural so politically one of the biggest challenges for indians who go to america is that you need visa getting a visa is not easy and then extending the visa is even more difficult so there is even a temple of lord ganesh in in chennai in hyderabad and a few other places just called as visa ganesh temple that ganesh is vigna vinashak is a remote obstacle so the obstacle to fulfilling my dream to go to america is that i don't get a visa so you go to lord ganesh and pray so now prabhupad got a visa because he was sponsored by someone in america and when the son of his not even a follower son of one of a pious indian gopal agarwal but the if you see getting the visa and then prabhupal had to extend the visa the visa was just for 2 months and if you consider american history the way it was around 1920s around 1925 or something like that roughly you know the immigration became very closed they made it very very difficult for people to come to america if you see america is itself a land of immigrants uh, the people who live in america now are all people who came from europe and the native americans who were staying there for thousands of years have now just been reduced to reservations if not eradicated but at one particular point america felt that you know there are too many immigration immigrants coming and there are people coming from japan and other places which they didn't want to come and they they clamp down the rules very much so it was just a few months you could say even a few weeks before prabhupad went to america that the immigration rules became relaxed and it was because they were relaxed that prabhupad getting the visa was not a problem but extending the visa was a problem and prabhupad was able to extend that visa because these rules change now we could say this is just some political change that is happening yeah that is true but krishna can work in extraordinary ways krishna can work through the political social cultural uh, changes that happen in the world and prabhupad was endeavoring krishna was arranging this so prabhupad was able to extend his visas almost eight to i think yeah six or eight times and finally he said that he said you know we cannot extend your visa maybe four five times exactly but a significant number of times he got to extend and then they said we can't extend and then prabhupad was so transcendentally innocent he said prabhupad that you know the only way you can have your visa is you know, actually if you are related to somebody in america you know in america there's a big sometimes it becomes a scam people have fake marriages they marry someone and then they they separate them from that person they they should want a visa so prabhupad said to one of his disciples he said okay you adopt me as your son now the devotee was of the age of prabhupad's grandson that is prabhupad prabhupad just had faith in krishna you adopt me but then there was one popular singer allen ginsberg who who was influenced by prabhupad and he used his attorneys you know he had been because he was propagating that drugs are used for spirituality and american mainstream opposed that so he was persecuted and he fought against it so he had a good battery of attorneys and he used that and well, actually prabhupada at one time was almost planning to quit america and go to canada canada has relatively easier immigration policies and prabhupada decided to make montreal his international headquarters but then this worked out and then prabhupada stayed on in america so krishna was arranging in various ways for the stage and the political is just one part of it the other was religious that the, the christianity in general the abrahamic religions the abrahamic religions are christianity judaism and islam and within that the biggest of course is christianity so christianity had that idea that 
anybody who is not following Jesus is going to go to hell. Hmm. And because of that, they were not only suspicious of our other religions, they were actually uh, very critical and condemnatory and uh, destructive about other religions. Now, Islam was much more destructive, but Christianity is also no less. But just again in 1965, something changed. The Catholic Church did something. Catholicism is one group within Christianity. The other group is Protestants. But the Catholics, they, they had a Vatican Council. And then in 1965, they affirmed that there is truth and there is God in other religions also. And this is how Shri Prabhupada actually was able to go to universities and talk. And there were because the people were, in one sense, so apprehensive about, oh, even if we explore some other religion, we'll go to hell. But there was an openness. And of course, among the masses, it was not so much, but among the scholars. And there are many scholars who came to meet Srila Prabhupada and try to learn what Prabhupada was teaching. And that opened many doors for Prabhupada. So Krishna arranged that stage. The timing was there. And the most important was from the cultural perspective. See, what had happened is that time in America, there was phenomenal prosperity. See, after the, sec the Second World War, more or less ended in 1945. You know, it, uh, and recently there was this movie Oppenheimer which uh, talked about how America uh, bombed Japan and how Oppenheimer was behind it. But the point was that in the Second World War, America war, it emerged not just victorious, but also prosperous. Why? Because there was practically no attack on America. The only attack was in Pearl Harbor. And of course, American soldiers went to the Euro Europe and other places, Africa and other places to fight. But America was supplying, there were least casualties. And America was supplying weapons to everyone. Hmm? So their weapon manufacturing industry became very big. And because of that, they gained... Uh, uh, enormous prosperity and the generation after that that means since 1945 the people who returned back they when they grew up they had lots of wealth and the generation that came after that I maybe mean the 1960s generation they had ev almost everything material was there for them because they grew up in an america that was prosperous they had wealth, they had comforts, they had luxuries. And there is this whole idea of what is called the great American dream. You know, you have a white house with a picket fence and you have a garden and you have a car and you have a nice family. And these people grew with all this. And then they found that this was just not satisfactory. Well, it was all meaningless. There has to be something more in life. And that's how so what happened was there was this great American culture. I'm using the word great in terms of it was uh, it is a spread across broader society. There was the American culture and that was a culture of at that time material prosperity. But especially among the youth there was a significant thing which was the counterculture. The counterculture, they just felt that oh, mainstream religion, mainstream education, mainstream politics, mainstream society, all of it is just insubstantial. That was the time the Vietnam War was there and they felt that this war is being fought just to, to make the uh, weapon manufacturers wealthy. So these, the counterculture, they were out to reject everything mainstream. Education, religion, politics. And within that, there was a small denomination that were the hippies. And these hippies, so all, this whole counterculture was exploring something alternative. 
and the hippies were especially into exploring through drugs so when shri prabhupad went to america this was the demographic which was extremely open and receptive and krishna arranged for prabhupad to go at that time so if you see in the time scale it was between 60s and 70s now if prabhupad had gone in this generation there was no counter culture now of course we can say that krishna could have uh, arranged for prabhupad uh, to be effective in any way and that's possible but when we look at what was happening and how prabhupad reached there at the right time we see that krishna was guiding shri prabhupad no oh, the prabhupad could have gone to america earlier but that didn't uh, but uh, but now whether he, this the socio cultural factors which made people receptive whether they would have been there or not that's open to question so krishna arranged like i said that he arranged the stage and after the 70s at least for the 70 75 it was only hippies the counter culture was a large group and they were exploring but hippies means most of the people who were in the counter culture they got into drugs and then once they got too much into drugs then they just were not capable of exploring spirituality so this period was almost like a golden period that prabhupad arrived in america at a time when people were looking for alternatives they were looking for alternatives alternatives to what was being presented to them in mainstream western society and then shri prabhupad gave them the best alternative by far the best alternative so this is how the timing worked out perfectly for prabhupad and this is in no way to minimize what shri prabhupad did now just because a stage is set up does not mean automatically the uh, the performance is going to be excellent now, sometimes in cricket a pitch might be a batter's paradise but still the bat bats batter has to bat well batter has to be expert and in good form so that brings us to the second part now you know how shila prabhupad how how what did he do now how he presented bhakti in an expert way that is we look at the teaching so i'm talking about three things timing teaching and tuning so in terms of teaching what did shila prabhupad focus on it's fascinating that when we look at the gaudiya sampradaya down coming from the various acharyas down so if we consider bhakti siddhant sri thakur when he sent his disciples to the west for them the main book of teaching was a book called shri chaitanya shri krishna chaitanya that was a book written by one of the disciples of bhakti siddhant sri thakur nishikant sanyal bhakti siddhant sri thakur probably practically co-authored the book but they were focusing more on the teachings of love of shri chaitanya mahaprabhu and there was practically no reference to the gita the gita was not in any way a central book in bhakti sanskrit sri thakur's outreach but shri prabhupad his focus was almost entirely the gita prabhupad introduced chaitanya mahaprabhu he introduced krishna krishna in terms of krishna and vrindavan then radharani all these much later these all these came later but first was the gita so what if you consider that means this is again the expertise of a teacher if you consider vedic texts you know they are a vedic wisdom or vedic text it's a vast body of literature and if you consider somebody is a say a speaker and that person is speaking to an audience so now from within the tradition that speaker can draw something from one part can draw something from here 
can draw something from here. They can draw from various parts and reach the audience. Now, which which part of the teaching does a person draw? That indicates that that is the expertise of the of the teacher. Prabhupada himself explained realization. Realization, he said, what it means is to take the original message, but to present it in a way that is interesting to the audience. So we could say, on one side is the scriptural message, and the other side is the audience interest. So it is the speaker's expertise. Realization means that the speaker is able to understand where these two intersect. So the teach message and the interest. And when somebody is able to present in this area, that is where they will have the maximum impact. So what did Srila Prabhupada present? So now Prabhupada presented many, many different things, but let's focus on what was the emphasis of Srila Prabhupada. Now, Pr now Prabhupada was very sharp, astute observer of human nature. And Prabhupada focused primarily on the difference between Atma and Deha, the soul and the body, their difference. In many ways, what Prabhupada presented was radically challenging and demanding. The teaching was hugely demanding. For example, what is the demand? You know, two hours chanting. In many ways, this was quite radical. In Gaudiya Math, they had, Bhaktivedanta Sarakur said that 64 rounds chanting, anybody is not doing, that person is fallen. But 64 round was not the initiation. Wow. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, so two hours chanting for Western people was extraordinary. Prabhupada's God brothers, when they went to UK, they didn't demand anything like that. And then he also asked for four regulative principles. Now we could say, Prabhupada is not asking, is a scriptural teaching? Yes, it is scriptural teaching. But Prabhupada emphasized it. So now, how was he able to get people to follow this? Now, this, this was something which when I read the Leela Amrit, it struck me enormously that you know, here is this old man. I, says, I was in this 1996-97. Uh, when I was just new, I said, this is an old man. He has worked so hard to finally get to America in his old age. And now he is speaking something which is almost guaranteed to alienate people. Now, in one sense, at that time, meat eating, intoxicant, gambling, illicit sex, these were just normal ways of living for people. You could say the only regulative principle for the people in the counterculture, their only regulative principle was to break all regulative principles. You know, reject rules. One of the, one of the common slogans of that time was, it is, it is forbidden to forbid. You know, you have no right to tell us not to do anything. The only thing, anybody can, can, anybody can do anything except one thing. That is, tell others, don't do anything. Don't do a particular thing. And in this culture, so when I said Prabhupada set the stage, Krishna set the stage for Prabhupada, that does not, so at one level, the audience was receptive. They were open to spirituality, but that does not mean the audience was submissive. Hmm? There's a big difference between the two. See, there is, sometimes we think receptive and submissive are the same thing, but they are hugely different. See, receptive means I am open to hearing. Okay. I want, I, I want to give you a okay, fair case. I, I'm okay to hear what you're saying. But submissive means open to following. 
and the stage was set for Prabhupada in the sense that the audience was receptive. That, okay, they wanted something alternative. But what Prabhupada demanded was shocking. The churches also would not demand. They uh, emphasize, of course, uh, no sex outside marriage. But apart from that, they're saying, is okay, you can drink, but don't become drunk. And apart from that, they were not really so strongly against anything. And certainly none of the churches or any mainstream religion demands two hours of spiritual practice dedicated. So how was Prabhupada able to reach? It was almost as if Prabhupada was making a demand that was likely to alienate people. But Prabhupada was expert. Now what Prabhupada was offering was an authentic spiritual experience through the kirtans, through the practice of bhakti, through the seva, the adventurous service that Srila Prabhupada gave to his people, gave to his followers. The kirtans themselves were far out spiritual music. And people could just immerse themselves in experiencing something higher. Many Indians, when eventually they started uh, coming to the temples, they saw that yeah, we used to go to kirtans in the past in India. But kirtan was more like a, in general, <laughs> In, in in traditional India, kirtan is more like a ceremony where somebody is doing kirtan and people politely stand and they gently clap. But in ISKCON, kirtan is like a party. You know, it's not a sober ceremony. It's like a festive celebration. Sing and dance and people were so earnest. And everybody was stunned by that. Even Indians were stunned and they got some authentic spiritual experience. And not only that, Prabhupada gave them adventure. His teaching was that not only you become, you start chanting Krishna's names, you become a devotee of Krishna, but you share Krishna with the entire world. And that just triggered their imagination. Just uh, it. It, Americans have this uh, spirit of uh, the rugged adventurer you know, going against the world. That's how they conquered the wild west. That's what they say. So Prabhupada triggered that. And you know he used to keep a good picture of a globe. Not a picture, a globe uh, in his room in 1960s, 1967, 68. And he, one time he told his followers, he says, you know, all of you pick one, one country. And go and deliver that country. And one of his female disciples, she was just a teenager at that time, Jadurani Devi, she said, Prabhupada, what about us girls? He says, we are not boys or girls. We are all souls. You also pick up one country and go and deliver. So, that sense of adventure that Srila Prabhupada presented. So, that, that created within them a spirit of sacrifice. Yeah, we are doing something astonishing. We are doing something extraordinary. So Prabhupada, uh, from the vast teachings that were there in, in Krishna consciousness, Prabhupada offered them experience, experience of Krishna through Kirtan, through outreach, an adventurous outreach. And even when Prabhupada focused on following the four regulative principles, his focus was very clear. He said, give up sense gratification. Now before... I had read many spiritual authors before I came to ISKCON and before I read Prabhupada's books. But I had not even heard this word sense gratification. And Prabhupada emphasized that. And what was his reasoning? That's very important. The Christians talk about giving up certain level of sense gratification. But they talk about it in terms of if you don't do this, you will go to hell. But Prabhupada hardly ever talked about hell. There was reference to hell in our scriptures, but there is not that was not the emphasis of Prabhupada. Prabhupada's emphasis was you can do so much better. You can do so much more. It's like you are a soul. You are meant for spiritual happiness. Why are you eating this, uh, this rukhi chapati, this dry chapati when you can be having a feast? So this itself was mind-blowing. Sex was considered to be the greatest pleasure at that time. And drugs was considered also a way to go high. And this Swamiji came and said, no, 
not that if you do this, you'll go to hell. No, this is just insignificant. And so much more available for you. Why don't you see that? So it was a very affirmative presentation of bhakti. Sometimes we, when we are presenting bhakti, we can actually miss out on this affirmative aspect. One of Shri Prabhupada's senior disciples who was doing college outreach in America, he asked Prabhupada, how do I present Krishna Bhakti? And Prabhupada said, the worst thing you can do is to present Krishna consciousness as a set of rules. It is presented as wisdom and adventure. It's wisdom that you, you, you have so much more potential within you, finding inner happiness for finding outer contribution. There's so much more for you to do. And that message resonated with people in an enormously effective way. So that was Prabhupada's expert teaching. And that brings me to the last part now. That is the tuning. So the way Shla Prabhupada was able to resonate with his audiences. Tuning is somewhat related with teaching. But by tuning, what I mean is that people from Prabhupada was expert in reaching out to different people from different audiences. Sometimes you know, we tend to take one statement of Prabhupada and we absolutize it. This is what Prabhupada said and, I, and, and if you're not doing this, then you're not following Shila Prabhupada. So Prabhupada made strong statements about scientists. Prabhupada made some strong statements about uh, mainstream education. Prabhupada made some strong statements about various, various, various spiritual leaders who were not giving the ultimate personal understanding of the truth. Uh, so Prabhupada could be like a surgeon who would cut. But Prabhupada was a surgeon. Prabhupada was not a butcher. He was not indiscriminately cutting here and there or anywhere. So sometimes when we take one statement of Prabhupada and absolutize it, then we think we are being a surgeon, but we end up being a butcher. And when Prabhupada as a surgeon would remove misconceptions. Hmm? But when we do the same thing, we, end, we, we don't remove misconceptions. We end up removing inspiration. We just alienate people. We come off as fanatical. So I'll talk about how Prabhupada was expert in tuning to various people and presenting accordingly. Uh, now, Prabhupada was with us, especially actively outreach was from 1965 to 77. So till approximately 70, Prabhupada was mostly in America and in the Western world. And after that, it was even India. And in India, he spent uh, maximum time in Juhu. But while he was in India, Prabhupada's approach or his focus was significantly different. You see, Prabhupada had two distinct groups of followers. So I'll use the word followers in a broad sense. There is the Prabhupada's followers. So, so first were his disciples, those who joined in 1965 to 70, and they continued joining thereafter. And these were extremely dedicated. They were, you could say, single pointed. Vyavasaya, Trika, Buddhi, Ekeha, Kurunandana. And they were chanting 16 round. They had moved into the temples. They were dedicated to Prabhupada. Now, when Prabhupada came back to India, Prabhupada had a plan that Indians are infatuated with the West. When his Western people start practicing bhakti, Indians see that. Indians will be inspired. And that did happen. But still, something did not happen. That India at that time was having, you know, it was too crippled by poverty. It was too fascinated by West, by the West. And it was too obsessed with politics. Obsessed with politics with the hope that political change will bring about a better India. And this was the situation 
pre 1965 and this was a situation post 1970 also so it didn't change dramatically so what happened was that even when shila prabhupad came it was not that a uh, lot of people started becoming disciples because still these these factors were there but this one factor fascinated by the west prabhupad tapped that and he created this program of life members and with the life members prabhupad would have robust philosophical discussions at times but prabhupad was very accepting so here with with his disciples he expected commitment now they gave up gave their life to krishna and prabhupad very much appreciated that but prabhupad here accepted contribution contribution means whatever some of them did did financial contributions they some of them gave some contact some of them gave some logistical support and that's how the juhu temple was built it's an adventurous story of how it happened and now prabhupad did not push the life members when he was meeting them he was not guilting them why are you not chanting 16 rounds when are you going to take initiation no prabhupad was not doing any of that prabhupad accepted them in fact many of these life members they were established people in society and they were also they were pious and because of their piety they had already affiliated with other spiritual teachers some of them were, were prominent leading disciples of other spiritual teachers who were prominent in india who prabhupad would normally talk about as mayavadis but prabhupad did not fight with them i did not criticize their spiritual teachers in front of them in fact prabhupad would go to their houses at times and there would be these big pictures of these these mayavadi gurus and prabhupad would just be nonchalant about it and he would focus on engaging them in krishna service so tuning means when i'm talking about tuning what i mean is that we need to encourage people we need to understand where people are at and help them take steps toward krishna so we need to be attuned to people's level krishna from where they are so this is something which is extremely important say for example you know, suppose somebody comes to a temple now say if this is a temple with a nice big spire on top and now suppose this is the ground level and we expect people to take a high jump from here to come to the temple now or say suppose the temple is on some place like tirupati balaji which is on top of a hill people have to climb up all the whole thing and come you know if they have to take a jump many people may not even take the jump they'll just come here and go back or they will try to jump and they'll fall and they'll go lower but somebody who is wise somebody who is expert what they will do is they will actually create steps okay gradually you come forward in that way you can enter the temple so in india shri prabhupad had the step wise approach so in the west his disciples were ready to take this giant leap leap of faith western disciples they took that leap of faith where they gave up everything to surrender their life to prabhupad but indian life members indians were not ready for that so prabhupad provided them the step wise approach and thousands and thousands of people became life members at that time in fact the because iskon was so respected that there were people at that time in their name plates they would put iskon life member as as if that was a significant achievement and shri prabhupad in this way was expert so this expertise that from where a person is how can we take them a step forward yes we would like them to go all the journey but if they are not ready to go 
all the way and let them take one step forward, one step forward and let them gradually come toward Krishna. This was Shri Prabhupada's compassion. His compassion was that he provided people the two things, the space and the pace. So those who wanted to go fast, he gave them the pace. Those who wanted to go slow, he gave them the space. Okay, you can do this much and then you can take your steps forward. And that was Prabhupada's uh, reflecting Krishna's teaching in 4.11 in the Bhagavad Gita. That is, Mama Vartamanu Vartante Manushyaha Partha Sarvasha. All people are on my path. So, I, in my Gita Daily article, I try to present uh, the Gita's message in, in a poetic or quote like say, format in English. So, I put this 4.11 as from your place. At your pace, access Krishna's grace. From your place, at your pace, access Krishna's grace. So this was Oshila Prabhupada's mood of compassion. And we too can try to imbibe that mood today. Now India is at a very significant position in the history of the world. Where India is asserting itself globally. Geopolitically, India is a rising power. Economically, India is a rising power. And as this is rising, there is an increasing awareness of dharma. Increases awareness of nationality and spirit, the, the spiritual, cultural, intellectual wealth of India. So then, uh, at this particular point, if we can tap this opportunity also, for those who want to go all the way, we provide them facility to go all the way. For those who just want to take a few steps forward, we encourage them to take those few steps forward. If we can do that, then we can play our part in carrying forward Shri Prabhupada's mission. Some of us, we may have a big part. Some of us, we may have a small part. But you know, when we are talking about service, we focus not on getting a bigger part. Oh, you know, I would like to give classes where thousands of people come or I would like to have some special ability by which when I distribute books, no, I can just distribute hundreds of books in one day. If you can getting a bigger part, that's fine if we get it. But instead, we focus on playing our part better. Whatever is the service that we have, service attitude means this is the Krishna's mission is far bigger than you and me or anyone else. But we are fortunate that we all have some part to play in it. By Prabhupada's mercy, not only are we getting ourselves raised in Krishna consciousness, but we are also getting opportunities to raise others in Krishna consciousness. So whatever be the talents we have, whatever be the approach facilities we have, whatever be the inspiration we have, whatever be the situation we are in, we just take heart from... Uh, the fact that we are in Krishna's mission, we are in Prabhupada's shelter, and let us all do our part in moving ourselves toward Krishna and helping others move toward Krishna. That is the best way we can serve Shri Prabhupada and commemorate his appearance day. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke about Prabhupada's extraordinary outreach in three terms. The first was timing. In that I talked about two things, how Prabhupada's perseverance is legendary. And how in spite of so many obstacles, Prabhupada consistently went on. And then I talked about how the stage was set for Prabhupada by Krishna in terms of the political openness in terms of immigration, the religious openness in terms of accepting the truth in other traditions and especially the cultural openness in terms of the counterculture which came because of the prosperity of America in the post-World War. And that's why people were receptive. And then we talked about teaching. How Prabhupada was an expert teacher who was able to find the intersection between scripture and the interests of people. And those interests, 
stand on two things giving wisdom not not just like creating fear you'll go to hell if you don't do this no there's so much more you can do and then providing experience he provided experience by presenting bhakti as adventure especially outreach as adventure and in that way he was able to reach to a large number of people and he was able to the even though the audience was not submissive but because he provided them experience so they were able to grow so they were receptive and from receptive gradually they became submissive and then we talked about how the tuning of shila prabhupad sometimes we have this idea that prabhupad was just uh, cutting and smashing everyone but that is not shila that was definitely one aspect of prabhupad but prabhupad was expert and prabhupad's mood was to engage people according to where they were at so he accepted his dedicated disciples and he also accepted uh, uh, willing life members who were not necessarily ready to contribute not ready to commit but they were ready to contribute and prabhupad was broad enough to accommodate both of them and engage them and elevate them so prabhupad's over, overall mood was in terms of his compassion was such that for those who were serious he gave them space for those who were not that serious he gave them space and if we can follow in prabhupad's mood and just try to play our part better then we will ourselves be able to move closer to krishna and we will also be able to help others move closer to krishna thank you very much hare krishna do we have time for questions are there any questions maybe one question if anyone has yes please hare krishna prabhu ji hare krishna uh, am i audible prabhu ji yes yes thank you very much prabhu ji for wonderful class prabhu ji uh, very nicely you uh, uh, covered this three aspect of prabhupad lives it was very eye opening and practical relevant so prabhu ji you were mentioning about this uh, krishna consciousness prabhupad how he presented it as a wisdom and adventures <clears throat> so not as a, a rules and regulation and all so so my question is that prabhu ji how uh, like we can present this krishna consciousness because sometimes some rules and regulations are there and for new people or new boys uh, that also become a little difficult like uh, waking up early and all or whatever some some things are there like that so how we can present yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. See that. See, it was not that Prabhupada didn't uh, didn't uh, talk about rules and regulations. Of course, he talked about regulatory principles, and there are definitely rules. But the point is something different over here. The point is, what is the emphasis? The emphasis is not so much the rules. See, in some way, rules are, you could say, rules are like roads. when you are going on a road that itself brings a restriction oh you cannot go here you cannot go here but then instead of t- when we are going on a road the point is oh you can go here and if there is an attractive destination here hmm, then we just focus on following the rules because we can get to that destination so that's why within our presentation if we focus on the attractiveness of krishna the sweetness of bhakti the excitement of service then the rules don't become the emphasis so it's a matter of emphasis yes and some people may just not be able to follow the rules and then as i said they they can be encouraged to practice bhakti they may not be able to say stay in our youth centers but they we don't have to reject them but if we, the emphasis is on these positive things so rules when we are traveling on a road we have to follow the rules 
but the point is not to follow the rules the point is to get the destination so similarly if we are focusing on the destination the the then what will happen is the rules will be seen in the light of purpose mm. so when these things are highlighted then it becomes much easier okay yes okay. thank you very much sir thank you Sorry, i have one more question if we have time can we come back to you there's few other questions also we can take and we can come back hmm. i see some other hands also raised if there's no one else then you can ask please go ahead hari krishna prabhu ji yeah uh, thank you very much ji for the nice class you were mentioning about uh, the western disciples uh, taking a huge leap of faith to jump from the ground level directly very nicely you are presenting but then for indians propa created those steps so what if people to whom we are targeting don't want to climb the ladder up and are like somewhat you know be good do good to others you know so they want to they just get stuck on the first or second step itself so what can be done for those kind of people as you are answering to this last question that uh, yeah. we we don't have to discourage them but then we we find that the, these are the people who don't want to go ahead and as buddha also says that two people would never achieve perfection one who is materialistic and the other who gets stuck in between so i mean we want to convey them this also but they are not ready for that i mean so what can be done yeah yeah we can push people we can't force people so we have to if we find that people are not really ready to move forward then find other people who are ready to move forward we can see krishna conscious outreach as expanding circles you know somebody say somebody is coming from tamas if they write to rajas also that also is a good thing if somebody from rajas rises to sattva that's also is a good thing somebody from rises sattva to shuddha sattva that is also a good thing that is what we would like to have the most but for society to function we need people in sattva also so we see ourselves our mission is you see prabhupad seven purposes of iskon the first purpose was to correct the imbalance between material and spiritual values so at one level we can say that our purpose is to simply raise the consciousness of people and if that raising can happen up to krishna consciousness that's great but if it doesn't happen even a little raising also happens that's good enough we can't push people too much we can inspire them we can encourage them we can remind them but if they don't we don't have to push them away yeah let them stay over there krishna is also acting in their lives they will go through certain experiences where they will realize that yeah being good and doing good is not enough maybe there's something more we can be doing and sometimes we can also show them how they can be good and do good better by practicing bhakti that they can actually be better human beings there are many volunteer organizations that devotees can start where people may not necessarily want to say directly come to temple for chanting hare krishna but if we have something like food for life they want to volunteer over there if we have some environmental activism they can they want to contribute over there so somebody may not want to chant hare krishna but we have a go we have a go seva project and they contribute there so in one sense it is important for us the another way to look at it is that krishna conscious outreach is like extra, we have there are multiple circles and our purpose at the center of the circle is krishna and we would like people to come to krishna but even if they don't come forward even if they come one step forward also that is good so we will also have different devotees who have different moods Now, some devotees may be very happy to engage with people and just inspire them to become well wishers or supporters and that's what gives them juice others they don't get that rasa unless you get people to become committed to become initiated if that's where we get the rasa then we focus on that audience and the world is big enough for uh, different uh, moods to serve different levels so rather than thinking of krishna consciousness as only one mood 
where everybody has to come to one level. It can be, you know, in the seven purposes of Prabhu ISKCON, Prabhupada doesn't say that everybody has to wake up early in the morning. Prabhupada doesn't say everybody has to stand 16 rounds. Are those, are those important purposes? Of course they are important. But is that all ISKCON is about? No. Now, if you look at seven purposes, Prabhupada is so broad and inclusive. So we can encourage people to take just one step forward toward Krishna. Nowadays, especially after the pandemic, there are so many young people who are coming to the temples. It's like it's about coming to temple has become cool. Now, they may not necessarily want to become devotees, but if you just provide them some facilities to a welcoming atmosphere to come to the temple, that's great. So you know, we have to find out uh, how best to uh, accept people where they are and give them facility to move a step forward. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Jagannath Sadhapramo. Uh, Hare Krishna, Prabhupada Dandar Prada. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Roji. So many enlightening, uh, thoughtful. Especially I like this point that butcher and surgeon difference. That butcher removes the inspiration and surgeon removes the misconception. So, Prabhuji, I also have doubt in this. Uh, uh, Sometimes we also act like a butcher uh, uh, while explaining the concept in a such a um, new audience is there, like children are there. And if I am not comp uh, capable to explain with their uh, label of examples, then they take out the interest uh, from learning. So, and Many other experience also I have uh, uh, kind of. So what should be our uh, step in, in such where we are confused? If we fear that our outreach may be like that of a butcher which is taking away people's inspiration. Uh, just like kids, uh, uh, yeah, with, with kids. So generally with respect to kids, the most important then thing to do is to give them Happy memories of bhakti. You know, how many rounds they chant, what time they wake up, what they do, what toys they play with. All those are important, but they're not the most important thing. The most important thing is they should feel, oh, bhakti was when I went to a kirtan, a temple, I danced, I sang, I participated in drama, I did this activity, I did that activity. That is the most important thing because eventually they are going to grow they are going to become teenagers, they are going to become youth, and they are going to choose at that time. So, sometimes, you know, when we talk about uh, talk about uh, parenting or guiding children, basically, mm, there are two distinct aspects to this. You know, one is one is giving routines, rules, structures, the other is giving memories. Both of them are important. So in general, we focus more on the routines. You know, you, the routine means you do this, do this, do this, do this. But if that is all that the children remember, oh, you know, this Krishna consciousness means you know, sitting down for an hour and chanting when I just didn't like it at all. Then as soon as they get freedom, they will they will just go away completely. So in my understanding, at least, we focus more on giving them memories of bhakti. And yes, there are certain mountains which have to be imposed, no doubt, enforced. But we have to be very cautious about that. And especially in today's world, the society is changing. And um, if, if we try to impose too much on kids, they will just become rebellious and go away. And the attrition rate, in general, among religions is very high and ISKCON has the among religious organizations that have survived for more than 30 years ISKCON in the entire world ISKCON has the worst attrition rate worst attrition rate means from our first generation uh, generally for a religious organization to survive and grow between 70 to 80 percent of that organization's children should grow up and become uh, take up that religion in ISKCON it is the first generation it is less than 5% it is uh, probably less than even 1% but definitely less than 5% so our the the 
idea of imposing rules has been an unmitigated disaster in the first generation. And we don't want our second generation to do that. So we have to be very, very careful that we focus on giving them memories and not uh, just rules and impose rules and restrictions. They are there, but that is that should not be their prominent uh, remembrance of Krishna Bhakti. Okay. We will continue till nine o'clock. Any last question? Any last question? Yeah. My question is like from the first part of class when you were discussing timing that how Prabhupada, uh, like uh, before going to America, he struggled, uh, tried so many things, and like uh, which was supportive at the later part. So, like as a sadhaka, now we don't like I don't have to do that much. So what does it mean for me to uh, to like uh, contribute? Uh, is it my sadhana strictly following morning program and these things uh, which will uh, help me to grow? Or how is it so that these things uh, would be taken care of in long run? And how can we practice our bhakti seriously? Well, again, everyone is an individual. So there is the inner connection with Krishna that comes through our chanting, our study of scriptures, broadly our sadhana. And then there is our outer contribution that comes through our seva, that comes through our studies, that comes through our growing toward becoming a responsible, respected member in society. And ideally speaking, both of these go together. Now, for some people in some phases of their life, one of them may be more important. So we can contribute to Krishna in various ways. So <clears throat> we have to find out what is three things, you know, our interest, our inspiration, and our intention. By intention, I refer to our willpower. So we have to look at these three things and based on that we decide. So you could say these three are related but interest is a little bit more which comes from Swabhava. There are some things which you are naturally interested in. Some people are naturally interested in uh, in, uh, in music. Some people are naturally interested in books, some people are actually interested in say, uh, fire sacrifices and rituals, mantras, whatever. The inspiration comes from Sangha, from our association. When we see other devotees doing something seriously, we feel inspired. And intention comes from our samskara. We all have different samskaras. For some people, for example, they're, they're, the samskaras that they have from their past might make certain activities extremely difficult. So we have to find out from our, from these three things, our individual journey to Krishna. How can I, nobody else can sit in my body and work with my mind in going toward Krishna. I have to do that. So all of us have to push ourselves. But in pushing ourselves, we need to find out what is the sustainable way we can push ourselves? So we look at our interest, inspiration, and intention and find our, our way of moving toward Krishna. Ultimately, there is one path to go towards Krishna. But on that path, you can say there are multiple lanes. And not everybody will fit in the same lane. Different people may go through different lanes. So for somebody, the primarily lane by which they go through is sadhana. Hmm? For somebody, the primary lane that sadhana means, say, as you said, waking up in the morning and doing strict sadhana. For somebody else, the primary lane might be seva. Uh, for them, they may be very dedicated in terms of um, taking up committed responsibilities and serving, but uh, they may not be able to necessarily do sadhana. And all three go together, as I say, all of these various lanes go together, but 
we might find it our our most comfortable lane lane might be one thing so for somebody else it might be swadhyay and prachar now sadhana and swadhyay are not combining the two the sadhana is more about a uh, specific morning program Sa swadhyay is more about studying scriptures going deep into the philosophy analyzing so that requires exclusive focus seva could be distribution dt worship outreach whatever thing so we have to find out the lane that we that is that works best for us on the express way to krishna okay so thank you all very much for your uh, enthusiastic participation and thoughtful questions shri prabhupad ki jai shri prabhupad avirbhav maha mahotsav ki jai shri krishna bhagwan ki jai गौर भक्त वृंद की जाय निताय गौर प्रेमानंदे हरि हरि बोल